Okay, good morning everyone. I think this talk is maybe slightly switching in focus. It's less of a uh, on prediction, but more on what, some of the, what are some of the processes that are relevant for studying the ocean and the sea ice in the north, uh, especially in around Canada. I'm going, for, going to be going from the Arctic Ocean through the sort of the waters that came north, Baffin Bay, and down to the Labrador Sea, and then how we might want to consider representing those processes in various models of various resolutions, and sort of then how we can integrate uh, those ideas for both climate type applications as well as what, what are sort of the next generation very high resolution models we can use to look at some of these questions. And I want to be talking about this sort of in a framework of a university research group, but I want to make very clear, especially for those here in Canada, this is done very much in collaboration with the other NEMO modelers across Canada, especially those with the federal government working on concepts or the Canadian Three Ocean Downscaling System. There's been a lot of interaction, a lot of discussion uh, through these processes. So I'll talk a bit about the modeling setup that's going to be used here to begin with. Then I'm going to talk about some applications, looking at it, just a few science questions going from the Arctic Ocean through the Canadian Arctic Archipelago and into the Labrador Sea, touching on where eddies, small-scale processes, processes, mixing, et cetera, are very relevant uh, to understanding what's going on. Then talk about some, uh, at least our plans for going for very high-resolution modeling, especially up to 1 60th degree, and what that provides, what may provide. And then I'm going to end on a slightly different touch, but I'm going to put on sort of a hat associated with MAOPAR, the Canadian Marine Environment uh, which is a Canadian network, a center of excellence on marine prediction, and talk about, again, the NEMO Forum for trying to collaborate for all NEMO developments here in Canada. So in terms of modeling, we've been using this configuration or a pair of configurations that are regional to, with a, using a tripolar grid that allows us the highest resolution in the regions north of Canada, focusing on the Arctic and the Atlantic, and consistent with those also used in um, federal government, sea reg configurations, et cetera, to look at uh, this behavior, quarter and twelfth of a degree, uh, run over the last, mainly over the last 20 years, hindcast studies, but some longer hindcast going back to the 1950s, as well as some climate force studies out into the uh, 2070s to 2100. All the simulation I want to talk about here are forced ocean models or forced ocean sea ice models with various other components rather than coupled climate models. And we've used a number of different forcings, although the, as shown here, the main one is the GDPS from Environment Canada. Um, I'll also mention one key aspect is we, it says, it says here, we do not use any salinity restoring. Uh, we do, we're not trying to make predictions. We're trying to understand processes. I'd rather have a model drift and then try to understand what are the causes of that drift and what are uh, some of the processes going on here. As I said, because resolution is important, I really want to look at the role of smaller scale processes, shelf based and exchange, et cetera. We've done a lot of work with in Nemo, what they have is the AgRIF tool where you can do two way nesting, where we can have nests for the Sepolar Gyre, um, the Canadian Arctic, et cetera, R waters around Greenland, and I'll show some other nests additionally as I'm moving through this presentation. Uh, obviously, the, the reason is computationally, you've got, you've put, You've only got the higher resolution in a smaller region. Uh, we're also, because it's important, we are playing with an iceberg module. We do have a Lagrange and iceberg model embedded in uh, the system. That's important. Some of the work we've shown has shown that the safe fresh water that's coming off the Greenland ice cap follows different routes if it's released as liquid versus solid. And with icebergs, you get more exchange of fresh water actually into the interior of, for example, the Labrador Sea uh, gyre. Uh, there's also a biogeochemical model, but I'm not going to really talk about that today. So t focusing again on some of this role of question, the uh, smaller scale processes, et cetera, there's been a several talks already this week about the Beaufort Gyre. So we were really looking at sort of where, again, the Pacific water, its inflows. So we look, took, again, twin experiments, one quarter and one twelfth degree, and then looked at how the Beaufort Gyre structure ex expanded and changed. And you can see up on the top right, there's a pair of, uh, well, there's two pairs of figures looking at sort of the structure, the freshwater content of the two right figures. Uh, there's a passive tracer associated with the Pacific water. I don't think there's a pointer here. In f ah, there's a pointer. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I should have noticed that earlier. So this is a 
uh, accumulation of passive tracers. This is coming out of the Pacific water. This is the freshwater content. And we find that as the freshwater it, it, it enters the gyre and builds up, the main pathways of the currents, especially the transpolar drift, are aligned with those contours of freshwater content. And their structure changes very much uh, as the, ed the accumulation with time varies greatly due to the eddies. This plot is showing the eddy kinetic energy and 112 versus a quarter. And again, you can see tremendous increase in the eddy kinetic energy that brings a lot of water both from directly in, but also coming around from the transpolar drift back into the Beaufort gyre before it uh, flows southward. And if we were to look at this as an animation, that's hopefully gonna start, oh good. Uh, that's, look at, that's tagged to the amount of Pacific water entering at Bering Strait. Um, and you've got uh, the core degree simulation on the left, the 112th on the right. Uh, again, you can see these different pathways as was talked about previously coming off uh, the Chuck GC, the Alaskan slope. But there's quite a bit of difference in how that, that water gets into the gyre as well as extends around um, along the, through the Central Arctic and then into the archipelago depending upon the resolution of the eddies. You can again see lots of small resolution processes. And if we were to go all the way to the end, you would really see that the accumulation um, is set tremendously by what the small scale will um, accumulation. So I'm just going to move on. Uh, again, I'm touching on different, I want to just touch on different highlights. Another study we did also looking at pathways was looking at what would happen if there was, say, an oil spill or some pollutants spilled in the Canadian archipelago. And we looked at uh, different sites for releases where we released uh, Lagrangian tracers and then looked at the variability of that. And we see very much that in the Western Archipelago, for example, the Mudson Gulf region, et cetera, uh, anything released, uh, the flow, the invective pathways are generally actually into the Arctic Ocean, into the Beaufort Gyre, only small exchange into the rest of the archipelago. Although if you pick different years, there's still significant interannual variability uh, versus in the Central Archipelago, the main routes are again, of course, as we might expect through the Northwest Passage and down through Baffin Bay and potentially into the Labrador Sea, again, tremendous amounts of interannual inter variability. In the years where there's more sea ice, lower velocities, uh, any feature, any sort of spill, the particles here generally are going to remain for the most part within the central archipelago, while in years where there's less ice, stronger velocity, there's much, there's tremendous out export out towards Baffin Bay. And one, of the, another, one thing that we are also trying to explore, because there's a lot, we know the Arctic is a major, receives a lot of fresh water, is river runoff. And this, this is a question of how we drive ocean models in a technical sense. Typically, ocean models have used various data sets that either come from climate models or from averages over large rivers. There's a great river archive data set, et cetera. But that often only has the major rivers, especially and misses some of the smaller rivers, especially, say, around all the islands of the Canadian North. So in this, for this study, we've been working with a group at the University of Calgary who's taken the Swedish hype hydrological model, forced it with reanalysis products, in this case, uh, ERA interim, uh, and then did a, a hydrological model for all the rivers in all the water basins around the Arctic to give us an estimate of runoff to compare with a traditional sort of core-based die and trend birth runoff used in the ocean models. And then we ran two twin motion model experiments with these two runoff products. And I'll just plot, plot on this bottom one, which is looking at changes in the top 500 uh, meter freshwater content relative to average salinity of the Arctic. And if we say that there's up to 20 meters of fresh, relative fresh water stored in the Beaufort gyre, in these experiments, the difference from changing these two river runoff products are at like 25%, even after 10 years of simulation. And especially as we get a lot of the smaller rivers, there's a lot more discharge into, into the waters around the Canadian North, and then leading to export through Fram Strait, Baffin Bay. And you'll also see that signal in the transports in the Labrador Current, and then possibly then also mixed offshore into the Labrador Sea. In terms of 
since this session was called Observations and Modeling, I wanted to bring in an example that where we could directly use observation and modeling together to look at some interesting variability. So there's a US uh, NSF study, uh, funded project that I'm part of that's led by Craig Lee at the University of Washington, maintaining an array across Davis Strait between Baffin Island and Greenland to measure the exports of especially fresh water and how it might be changing. And we've been comparing the model fields with the observations, uh, at first off in the historical period, um, to look at behavior. So in this case, I've just got data from 2005 to two, end of 2013. And so the observations are shown in dark blue, so the, and this is the volume transport. And there's a lot of variability. It's about 1.5, 1.6 fair drift southward net export out of the archipelago into um, the Labrador Sea. But we also, and then I've put winter anomalies in dark blue, most cases, a small variability. But if you notice at the end of 2010, 2011, there's actually a case where the observate, where the flow actually reversed. And Davis Strait has two-way flow, West Greenland current flowing north, Labrador current, or sorry, Baffin Island current coming south, but and normally there's that net 1.6 south, but actually in this year, there was that, or those few months, there was actually the whole system switched to net exchange northward into the Arctic Ocean, or into Baffin Bay, for a period of several months. And then we looked at the high resolution model, and we also, again, see the same event um, at this period of time, and then we were able to use this mo the model to help track this event going farther north all the way to Nair Strait and the Arctic Ocean. And additionally, to try to understand the causes, we looked at the atmosphere, and we compared the mean sort of winter p conditions around the Labrador Sea to the specific year and looked at the anomaly. And basically, the Ekman trans, the winds had seemingly changed and the Ekman transports had switched from <laughs> offshore into the Labrador Sea to, to onto the shelf, trapping the waters on the West Greenland shelf and allowing, forcing them and allowing them to be flowed northward, uh, building up the transport of heat and fresh water going into Baffin Bay during this year. And this signal continues all the way north to Nair Strait, where you also have the same event. And during this and during another event we've been looking at the model, it leads to tremendous transport of heat into the Arctic, southern Arctic Ocean, into the Lincoln Sea, potentially having an effect on the uh, sea ice and the ice bridges in that region. And looking at the causes with some, some colleagues, we looked at, for example, the Greenland blocking index, looking at sort of the high pressure over Greenland. And if we pick this winter, this is the December, January, February, end of 2010, had the most extreme blocking index recorded over this 50 plus year period. And if we looked at sort of the storm tracks of the Mare Archive, there'd been a big shift from them going north to going much more southward, much towards to Europe at this period. So it seems to be a large scale atmospheric change leading to changes in the atmospheric forcing of the ocean that can then lead to significant events at the gateway straits of the Arctic that can lead to big changes of heat and that heat then may also play a role in, for example, accelerating the melt of tidewater glaciers in the Baffin Bay region. I'm, uh, for a period of time, I'm actually gonna skip ahead. I, for a couple of things, we've been looking at, um, sorry, I went one too far. We've also been looking at how the fresh water, when it comes out of the Arctic, goes out into the Atlantic Ocean, and again, in one quarter and one twelfth degree. And the key thing I just want to point out is, in this case, the resolution only has secondary effect. Almost all the flow along the western margin goes down to the Grand Banks, and it's in that region that it's exchanged offshore. And so it's, if we're thinking about freshwater impacts on the Labrador Sea deep water formation, it's, gonna, it's not the, this coast that's playing the key role, unless on longer time scales, it's gonna be exchanged off the West Greenland current. Um, now, going back to that, when I showed that result early on about the Beaufort Gyre, and we were talking about the role of the eddies and building up the fresh water, one of the concerns is the amount of fresh water. And it, it, the observations, this is from the Beaufort Gyre experiment, talk about 22 to 24,000 uh, uh, kilometers cubed of fresh water in the Beaufort Gyre. And in all those experiments I showed previously, I didn't talk about it at that point, but here's our model freshwater content. It's significantly less than the observations. So then we have the question is, 
uh, what processes are we missing? So, the, but then we've started recently running some global experiments because we're also interested in looking now in all the basins around Canada. And now we've got a bunch of experiments. With, they're global. There's different forcing, different sea ice model. But if you notice, all of them have in the early 2000s a rapid increase of fresh water in the Beaufort Gyre and freshwater contents that are now much closer to the observations. This is just experiments we finished this last week, so I don't have full answer, but it does maybe seem that r the dynamics ex of what's coming into the Arctic Ocean is going to respond to, uh, again, some of the pressure di differences between the Beaufort Gyre, the Bering Sea, and there's going to need to, one needs to look at some of those uh, two-way exchanges if one really wants to understand some of these Arctic processes. So this is just a quest comment that I've generally used regional models for many years, but now I'm thinking for some problems, regional models may have limitations. Going into uh, the future, we've tried to, we w we're trying to update our, also the 112 degree configuration I talked about, because we were now trying to put in from newer version of NEMO, the icebergs, the tides I've been talking about, also a newer, more advanced sea ice model to try to look at some of these uh, processes and pathways. And ad additionally, we've got a number of passive tracers embedded so we can try to look at, again, questions of where the river runoff is going compared to the Pacific water, where's the water mass is coming out of the Arctic, where's Greenland melt going, and understanding some questions about the fate of the Labrador seawater. And this next animation is just a little eye candy. It's not real science yet because we haven't finished it because I've got all seven tracers involved there. But it really could see as you've got look, now also we've got tidal mixing as 112-degree resolution. You could see some much small-scale process in how the Labrador, in terms of how the Labrador sea water is mixed, how the shelf waters mix off the, uh, off the coast. And you can, the Mackenzie water seems to be uh, in these newer experiments, much more flowing into the interior. So again, as we try to bring in additional of the smaller scale mixing processes, the significant changes in circulation pathway uh, we want to understand. And in terms of resolution, what's really got me thinking about this is we set up a triple nest using Agra for the Labrador Sea. So we have our standard core degree resolution, 1 12th of the subpolar gyre, and then we went up to 1 60th of a degree. So one, basically one kilometer. 800 meters to 1,200 meters in the Labrador Sea, and then did a series of 17, 15 to 20 year integrations using different forcing with Greenland runoff turned on and off to really try to understand the role of resolution, eddies, and shelf basin exchange for this important deep water formation region. And we're doing this because if we just want to think about the eddy resolving power and how many Rosby radius of deformation are resolved for bottom grid cell. Four degree resolve basically nothing. We can't of uh, the eddies. One twelfth is getting there in the interior, but it's having major issues on the shelf. And it's at only one sixty where we at least have two or more grid cells per Rosby radius, and thus can get a good representation of the eddies, as we'll see in a second. And here's just a movie that's going to show uh, the freshwater content evolution in the model. Um, and you can really start to see now the um, an exchange from, let me go on this side, from the Greenland side. So there's, this is where a lot of the eddies form, and we've done a sort of detailed analysis of the eddies looking at the relative roles of the barotropic and baric uh, clinic instability. Both are important, but the bear clinic is the most important, especially around Cape Desolation. But you also see that a lot of the eddy, uh, fresh water that's going in is also then mixing across and into the... Um, let me go back and replay this. Is, is, will come across and feed back into the Labrador current, where again, there's a, even at this high resolution, there's very limited exchange across the fresh water, and most of the fresh water is going south, and it's down around the Grand Banks, where it's really feeding off into Flemish Cap, and then mixing into the subpolar front, where there's most of this Arctic fresh water has been lost. This is consistent with, there's a recent paper by Henny, Penny Holiday that looked at uh, changes in wind and added exchange of fresh water coming off from the Labrador Current is again in this southern region. The other thing I just wanted to point out is again, there's fairly low in the interior, 
And with one sixtieth, what we found is we do see, let me replay it one more time while I'm talking. We do see that although there are eddy exchange of fresh water off this coast, if we do, again, the detailed budget of fresh water, the net transport of fresh water by the West Greenland Current farther north does not decrease, even though we shed these eddies. And it took us a lot of time to try to figure this out. But because at this resolution we're representing the coastal boundary current, the fresh water that's being shed from the West Greenland Current is being replaced by fresh water from the West Greenland Coastal Current exchanging into the shelf break current and then continuing north. So most of the fresh water from Greenland and even that comes around from Fram Strait is, there is exchange here, but it's, most of it actually goes into Baffin Bay and or it circulates all the way around. And this we only see at this high resolution. And again, for understanding, say, water formation in the Labrador Sea, the coarse resolution models have very broad, two broad regions of deep convection, while at the high resolution it's much closer to the observations, for example, from the Argo floats. And if we look at the, the heat content and freshwater content in the interior, the quarter and 12th degree, which are the green and red models, have, all, have drifted, same in our approach all models of the Labrador Sea, but the 160th is fairly stable. It has deep water for, uh, formation that's quite consistent, say, with the numbers suggested by the recent OSNAP measurements. So it really would seem understanding eddy exchanges and then parameterizing them uh, for coarser resolution models is needed if we want to properly represent all the freshwater processes going around the Labrador Sea, Baffin Bay, and how those link to the deep water formation. Um, given that the 160th result has been very interested, We've decided, although it's going to be very expensive numerically, we've decided to actually set up a 160th entire Arctic uh, configuration. We've just going through, I have no results from now, it's just in the spin up. Uh, it's going to be very expensive numerically, eight to 10,000 cores. We'll be running on various Compute Canada uh, supercomputers, and I expect it's going to take three to four years to run 20 odd years of simulation. But hopefully, having again those resolution will help us understand many of the process in the Beaufort Gyre. In the and the Canadian Arctic. Finally, in the last couple of mi minutes, I'm going to, as I said, I want to put on a different hat. Uh, there's many groups that use NEMO in Canada, and just as people talked about in the last, at the end of the last talk, da how database and sharing files is important, this is important in our community, and we want to find ways to make it easier to share forcing files, code, um, results, uh, have come seminars, share interest. So we've been working on putting together a Canadian NEMO forum uh, that will eventually involve bi-monthly virtual seminars, uh, GitHubs for sharing code, output, et cetera, and really working to take the development, say, from NEMO and, the, and Europe and the Drakkar team and share it among both the Canadian academic and uh, government and research communities that are using it. So we've got a forum. Um, as an example, we've just started with our group's information, but we've got everything from documentations, videos, details of all the experiments, the configurations, codes to uh, visualize has been put up. So again, we can share it and make it available also, not just to the modelers, but also say observationalists who want to take model output and use it. And I think this is an important thing going forward is if we have running high resolution models, we've got to find a way to, to, to make those uh, outputs and produce tools that everyone who wants to access them can use them. So I'll just stop here. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions here? Hey. Uh, what is your tuning strategy when you have such a heavy uh, uh, configuration uh, that you can only run once, uh, the one that you are just uh, explaining at the end? That, that's a really good question because obviously you can't, there's issues of you know, what parameters you choose um, and that. And so our, I guess our strategy is you know, there's obviously going to be model drifts, there's going to be model issues. Um, when it, when I actually go with the 160th degree model, we figured, okay, 160th is going to be way better than 112. We, our first experiment, 
10, 15 years in, we shut down all the convection in the Labrador Sea. And it was just, what? <laughs> um, you know, so it took us a long time to eventually figure, it wasn't actually the horizontal measurement, but because we increased the vertical resolution, we changed the topography along the shelf break, which determined the likelihood for the eddy, for baroclin and instability. We changed how much lateral exchange, and the air sea forcing product we chose, we had always been using a very weak product that, that, and the coarse resolution, because we didn't want to take too much buoyancy out because otherwise we produced too much deep water. Now when we had stronger lateral exchanges, the forcing couldn't break it. So we actually did have to go read back and rerun the 160th with a, with a stronger product, more of an ER, uh, Drekar ERA based one uh, to actually get realistic water formation. So yes, you're, 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 you're hoping that it is gonna work. You know, beforehand we talked to every colleague I knew about, you know, what's your thoughts on this resolution? What are some of the potential concerns? How do maybe we set some parameters? But otherwise then there's hope. And, but I would say, e give it, with these type of models, even if it's not perfect, even the one now without water formation is actually turning out really interesting for us to try to understand, again, some of that balance. So you just gotta uh, figure, figure that it's still gonna be valuable for a number of questions at the very least. I think I saw another question. Um, I had a question about the Labrador Sea convection as well and the veracity of the 60th of a degree, but you sort of partly answered it, but I was going to ask specifically, so you're, you're capturing these um, eddies off the west coast of Greenland. Is that, are you also doing a better job of uh, capturing the breakdown of deep convection in the spring? Because there's, you know, often that's eddy influenced. Or do we you know if you're doing a better yeah. job? <laughs> I would say yes. Like, for example, if... I don't have it up, but if I would look at, say, even the 112th degree, you would see mixed layers that get deep, and they'd, you know, they vary, but they'd remain deep, et cetera. Versus now you, we can really see, you know, a storm comes through, events, deep mixed layer, it shoals much more significantly. There's, it's, it's more consistent with, say, if I looked at the Argo floats or the year of data that's available from the sea cycler mooring in that. I don't want to say it's perfect, but it's, it's in the, heading in the right direction. So I'm an atmospheric scientist, so I have an atmosphere question. Uh, so you're running uh, an ocean model driven by the atmospheric forcing that you take from era five. Is that correct? Or from various reanalysis products, but okay. yes. So in the area that you were looking at, the Canadian Arctic, close to Greenland, the channel from the Arctic Ocean, down to where the North Water Polynia is, so the areas where you've got yeah. the fresh water. Um, 30 kilometers, that's the equivalent resolution in era five. That's not great for, you know, complex wind forcing patterns and temperature patterns, so have you given any additional thought to that? Um, yes, we have. Um, there's definitely, I can, there's definitely issues in terms of aspects of the forcing in that region. The sensitivity of the reanalysis product, if I want to say look at in the model, the exchange to near straight, and I could take, say, ERA versus the JRA versus the G Canadian GDPS, um, there's differences in the transport of 30%. So which is better, why, et cetera. Again, when there's observations, moorings, that helps. But yeah, there's a lot of sensitivity, and yeah, I'd love to have much more higher resolution that represents the orography in that area. So yes, uh, that's definitely a limitation. So to that end, at least I can, if you're not aware of it, uh, recently completed the CARA data set, which is a limited uh, reanalysis covering 30 years, 2.5 kilometer resolution over the Greenland area. So at least you should be able to resolve some regions around there. I'll talk to you afterwards at some point. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe a, one last question. Go for it, uh, Drew. So if I'm, 
if I'm not mistaken, and I probably am, that, that Davis Strait mooring is the western component of OSMAP, OSMAP isn't it? Or it, well, it goes, the Davis Strait Mooring Array has seven or nine moorings, depending mm -hmm. on deployment, going from Baffin Island across to the West Greenland Shelf. Yeah. There's another, I mean, it's the western component of the outflow, and there's a separate mooring yeah. that, that Avi runs up at Fram Strait. Yeah. Or, and the whole component all the way over to Norway, but... Yeah. Have you have you looked at, at some of the odds maps? Uh, we uh, we have. That? I've looked at every every strait. I've looked at Barrow Strait. Yeah. Um, that's that was one of the first things we've done. Um, that's one thing that's interesting is that for especially for the archipelago, the resolution doesn't seem to play a role in the mean transport. So if we look at Barrow Nares, like the moorings of Andreas Muncho, yeah. the East Greenland current measurements that's that since say some of Laura Disturbs papers. The mean transports are fairly similar in the quarter and the 12th degree. Um, but it's the variability that's very different. And for Davis Trade, when we have the 160th, is that high frequency variability is much closer to the observations. Yeah. But still, needs uh, to be improvement. Uh, uh, and I was just wondering if, if you saw the transfer to the other basins or? I think it would be similar. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Um, and thanks to all the